AI can transform you into a super marketer, especially if you create and produce content. If you don't believe me, Ryan Law, the former CMO of Animals, has seen it with his work in content marketing. There is a bunch of unskilled busy work that we find all of ourselves doing all day that we can actually just hand off for the time being. And I think we should do that. Today, Ryan shares his AI prompts he uses to speed up his content creation and distribution. It'll surely unlock the inner supermarketer inside of you. In this Marketing Pops episode, you learn first how AI can transform the way you approach content marketing, second, the role of AI in increasing productivity and reducing unskilled busy work, third, the importance of authenticity and credibility in content creation in the age of AI, and number four, how finding trusted advisors accelerated Ryan's career. Before we start, I've created a free power cheat sheet to help you apply Ryan's AI prompts for content marketing right away. You can download that at marketingpops.com or find the link in the show notes and description. You ready? Let's go. Today, we're going to be talking about something near and dear to your heart, content with AI and chat and thought leadership. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm curious what your take is on um, what what the future of SEO and chat GPT looks like uh, in, in, in terms of content. I know you wrote, you've been writing a ton of posts about it, and you've talked about what that could potentially look like for us. You know, what are the implications of that? You likely... One of your viral posts on LinkedIn, will, which I'll link in the in the description, talks about like, you know, in the post SEO, uh, post chat GPT world, this is what SEO and ca- content can look like. What the, for my listeners, what does that look like? Particularly, um, the, some of the implications you 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 already foresee. Well, that's a very good question, and uh, all of the writing is basically just to try and work out for myself, like what the heck is going to happen? You know, we make our living doing this kind of thing, and suddenly this crazy disruptive technology has appeared that could do all the stuff that I can do, but like in some ways so much better. Like I can't go out and read <laughs> Wikipedia and all that, you know? Um, so a big part of what we've been trying to do is just think through like second order impact of AI content. Cause there's some stuff that's like really obvious that will happen. It's now really easy to publish a ton of words on a page because you have a tool that is basically like a freemium SaaS product that can do that very intelligibly, very coherently at the click of a button. But assuming that is the case, what happens afterwards? I think of search as an ecosystem. Like we're all, not only are we trying to create things for ourselves and generate traffic for our companies, we're also doing that alongside other companies and their efforts. And the things that we do impact what other people have to do. And it's all this kind of delicate equilibrium. Um, and I think. Yeah, first and foremost, we are going to see such a big influx of new search content. Mm. So many companies have built their growth on organic search because it compounds over time. um, It becomes more affordable over time as well. And suddenly you can actually create a very legible SEO optimized post through a tool like Jasper or Writer or Copy AI or something like that. And, you know, it's as good as I used to be when I was like 20 years old and mashing stuff and cramming keywords into an article and hoping for the best it's at least as good as that and possibly better yeah which is like absolutely i mean i i've noticed like marketers take to two positions first is like actual awe and like curiosity where like they play around with it on the other hand like there's this like uh you know terminator <laughs> it's like it's the end of the world they're taking over the world uh you know skynet uh, the, you created. You have this really great video, actually, that I really love about um, negative visualization. And you talk about how, you know, plan for the worst case, and you start thinking about it. Well, like knowing that this thing is disruptive, what are like way, plans? You you actually listed a few plans that marketers can take in terms of like, hey, here's what you should consider. What are I'm, what are some things that you've been thinking about for yourself about like, how do you make sure that you, that we remain relevant in ter- especially we're like, so focused on what you just talked about around, you know, the content and SEO. I, you know, I'm both of those people. I vacillate between <laughs> those two different states. Like I am awed right. and amazed by it. And other days I wake up and I think, oh man, I wish they put the genie back in the bottle because <laughs> I'm a writer, you know, like I'm in trouble here. I got to do yeah. something. Um, I th- there is a lot that can be done even now, even pragmatically, even stuff that is useful given the current state of content marketing and not necessarily you know, only useful in the event of some crazy SI apo- uh, SEO apocalypse kind of thing. Um, for one, like 
there's a lot of marginal productivity gains that I think can be had through using AI. I, you've talked about this actually in terms of like your podcast, the production there. There is a bunch of unskilled, busy work that we find all of ourselves doing yeah. all day that we can actually just hand off for the time being. And I think we should do that because then that frees us up for the stuff that only we can actually do. And that is like higher leverage strategy and mm. second order thinking. Because there are plenty of things that generative AI is just never going to be able to do because it's not within the remit of how it was built. It is designed to create legible prose based on whatever inputs you give it. It can't right. go out and actually do those things. It can't come to you and say like, hey, I, I actually, I lived this experience. I did this thing. I learned from it. Here's what worked. It can tell you a story about doing that, but you know, words on the page don't, that's not everything that matters. Also the underlying experience, the credibility and authenticity of the person that's sharing it does matter. So I think in addition to thinking about how you can publish more words on the page, how can you increase the credibility and authenticity of the things you're writing? Like, what is it that you have experienced only you can talk about? Mm -hmm. What do you know that other people don't because you've done firsthand? What do your friends and your network know? What problems have they solved? I think making that the kind of core foundation layer of content marketing, whether you're doing SEO or sales enablement or thought leadership, that is a really great way to continually and always future proof against what generative AI can do because it will just never be able to do that stuff. You know, you you actually talked a little bit about this in in an article that you wrote around. You call this information gain, where like, you know, like there your AI can write a prose for you, but like all that stories and experiences, that's information gain that you know that, that it can add, and it's kind of veering, I guess, a little bit into. Would you consider that thought leadership? I, I know you have a discourse about thought leadership, but like, you know, there's like this, this uh, gray area, like the, it's become a buzzword, but like all that experience and information that is unique to your experience, you add that to this uh, article and it makes it like more rich, essentially. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah. I wish I could claim credit for the idea of information game. I'm not that smart, unfortunately, but um, it comes from like a, a Google patent that came out years and years ago. Mm. One of many like speculative things, Google patents that maybe, you know, maybe it'll make its way into how the algorithm functions, maybe not. But they were basically trying to solve a problem that we all face every day, which is you look at most search results and all the content there contains the same information. It's all like a mm. basic remix of one another. Because that's kind of how SEO functions in really competitive searches, isn't it? You know, 10 articles performing well, how do you outperform them? You take all the best bits of those 10 and you squish them together into your <laughs> one article and then you publish that. Uh, but obviously, if everyone does that, then all the content looks the same. That's mm. bad for you as the reader because yeah. it doesn't really matter which article you click, you're going to get the same information. And it's bad for Google because they're serving a bunch of like really homogenous search results. So the idea of information gain was, can they algorithmically reward content that brings something new, some new mm. facet of the topic, some new information, some new perspective that hasn't been covered, and actually can search reward that and actually become an incentive for better rankings? Uh, and as you say, that there's plenty of ways to do that. That your own personal opinion experience is fundamentally something that you can always add in addition to the existing search results because... Nobody else is you. Nobody else has done the things you have done, built the company you've built, you know, worked at the companies you've worked at, that kind of thing. Um, so I think thought leadership in terms of sharing stuff that you've done and you've solved and the unique experiences you have has a totally valid strategy for better search performance, adding value above AI content, and just generally making stuff that's a bit more interesting than what people have already published. Mm -hmm. When you said around like there's nobody like you, it reminded me of uh, Dr. Seuss poem where like uh, today there's nowhere newer than you. <laughs> so like that's such a good point uh, there that, you know, do you, do you see like a world where like it's going to be a race to the bottom? Because like you're talking about like AI being able to produce like a ton of things that look optimized for SEO right now. And it's just the bear is lower and really like what will 
uh, bubble up as a cream of the crop is what you're talking about. Those uniqueness that you can add to it that makes it totally different is, is exactly what I'm hearing you, you said. Uh, yeah, exactly that. I think any kind of growth strategy is, is a, works at a point in time. Because the more you do it, the more popular it becomes, the more you attract other people that want to do the same thing, and then you get diminishing returns from that. And that's true of anything. It's like a temporary form of arbitrage. And I think what we're seeing here, there's already been a race to the bottom for organic search content for the longest time. Like Everyone mm. is doing it now. I started out like 10 years ago, a, a content agency I co-founded, and we had to persuade people that content marketing was a, a valid thing to do. And you don't have yeah. to do that anymore. Like Everyone right. knows that it already is. Um, and it's basically become easier and easier to publish functional search content. You know, more people know how to do it. More people can do it for a cheaper amount than they've ever been able to do before. And we've reached a point now where you can do it basically for free. And for the naysayers among us, like if you take the average SEO article published by a person and compare it to one that you can spin up in a tool like, you know, Writer or Jasper. Mm. It's as good. Like I'm, I honestly see no in terms of like the ability to rank. I think it is as good as the average thing out there. Wow! And obviously, anyone can access these tools. It doesn't have to be a big enterprise company with a big budget to hire a big content team. You can be, you know, mom and pop shop solopreneur, and you can suddenly generate like fifty, a hundred, a thousand articles a month if you want to do. So I think, yeah, it's going to be pretty crazy the next few months. And when you can generate content that quickly and that cheaply. You may as well just target every keyword. Why bother being selective about it? You know, there's actually no need to in that case. So sure. if you, you were hesitant before, maybe you'll just publish like, you know, yeah, 50, 60 vaguely related keywords every single. That's absolutely crazy. And that, I guess that's the part where like, man, this is a scary world. Like there's going to be a ton of uh, really, really like, like content in the, you know, that's like optimized for SEO that's written by AI. And is it what also what I'm hearing is like tall leadership. Would you say that tall leadership is the way of the future or that sounds so wrong, <laughs> but like, would you say like, that's how you'll, that you'll, uh, you'll win, um, with, with like how you know, really to make your, your content stand out is, is, is what I'm hearing. Or did I hear, hear that incorrectly? So I think. Uh, I, I get a bit of criticism from people when I talk about thought leadership content because they say, Ryan, that's a really stupid thing to talk about because like, thought leadership is a status you want to acquire. Like, You want people to care about you and to care about the ideas right. you have and not everyone can do right. that. And I think that's true, but there are certain types of content that are more conducive to creating that status. Like publishing 20 how-to articles about basic, you know, marketing processes, probably not going to become a thought leader. Whereas sharing like, you know, personal experience, stories, anecdotes, refuting industry truisms, mm. doing original research and data collection, that is much more likely to lead to that status. And I think a lot of those activities, for the time being, they are great ways to differentiate from this like race to the bottom. Basically, what proprietary information can you and your company mm. create or gain access to that nobody else can gain access to? And put that in your content. That is, you need a moat in content, basically. We're all so inured and overrun by blog posts and PDFs and downloads and webinars. You have to really incentivize people to care about what you're creating. And the best way to do that is to have something that they cannot get anywhere else. Mm -hmm. um, that's, it's a hard thing to do, but I think that is probably the best thing to do these days. You talking about that just like made me realize that who is writing the piece or what company is writing the piece adds a lot to, to it. It's probably been true for a while, but it's going to be more true in the future where there's like a writer content fit or company content fit exactly where, you know, your credibility as a person, as a writer, as a creator, as a company really means a lot more for that thought leadership because you're embedding your experience. Exactly. Is what you're saying? Bye. I totally agree. I love that idea so much. And we're already seeing Google, they've been talking about this for a long time. They added an extra E into their EAT acronym, <laughs> didn't they, for like experience. They want to reward people that have experienced the thing they're talking oh, about. Interesting. And if, if you think about it, like, you know, I could write an article that might be accurate 
about uh, how to drive a Formula One car. You know, I could go out, I could probably find enough information on the internet to write that article right. and it'd be strictly true and strictly accurate. But I, I mean, I'm a terrible driver. Like, are you going <laughs> to trust my advice on that topic? No. But if the same topic was published by, you know, a Formula One driver, suddenly that advice becomes much more credible. Right. So I think the provenance of what we share, as well as the actual advice itself, is going to become more and more important. That, that, for, you got me distracted with Formula One. Do you watch? Do you yeah. watch it? Who I don't know. I, I, oh, probably right, this okay. is, I picked a really bad example. I know nothing <laughs> about Formula One other than that it exists. So. I was just curious. I watch it on Netflix. There's like Ham Lewis Hamilton and Max Verstappen. And I always ask people who, who they go with. So just a random uh, question there. In terms of actually embedding those personal experiences, and you, you talked about like, you know, going against uh, challenging truisms and then, you know, really embedding those those modes. How would people go about doing that? Um, did they start with like a structure and then adding on those experiences or would you go the other way around and actually like, let's interview, maybe both, <laughs> let's interview people around experts into this topic, including yourself, and then build a structure around that. It's a good question. And it, it's really hard to build a process for coming up with that kind of like creative ideation. Mm. Like that's a really, really hard thing to yeah. do. Because obviously with search content, you have keywords and that's a very concrete starting point. Whereas with, yeah, thought leadership and related ideas, where do you start? Um, I think what we always did at Animals that was a great port of call was start by talking to customers and sales prospects. Like, what are the problems they're encountering every day? Can, do we have an experience based on that that we can talk about? That's a really great starting point. You can get hundreds of articles out of that very simple app, probably. I think then the more you do that, the more you get a sense of what are the best practices lots of people subscribe to. Um, one of the articles at Animals that seemed to really strike a note with people was about um, like HubSpot and how mm. a lot of people, they look to HubSpot as this amazing example of content marketing, and rightfully so, but they then try and copy what they do for their company. And you know what? HubSpot is a post-IPO public company with a huge budget, and actually the stuff they're doing today is not what got them to the point they're currently at. So trying to copy that as a startup, you know, pre-seed or Series A or something, that doesn't work. Um, but I only was able to write that because about 20 people said to me on sales calls, you know, I love what HubSpot's doing. Let's just do what HubSpot's doing before our industry. So some kind of like way of imbibing these experiences, these truisms, these best practices at scale from your customers and your um, and prospects you're talking to, you will get more content than you'd ever know what to do with, I think, from doing that. Before I continue, I want to thank the sponsor for this episode, 42 Agency. Now, when you're in scale-up growth mode and you have to hit your KPIs, the pressure is on to deliver demos and signups, and it's a lot to handle. There's demand gen, email sequences, rev ops, and more. And that's where 42 Agency, founded by my good friend Camille Rexton, can help you. They're a strategic partner that's helped B2B SaaS companies like ProfitWall, Teamwork, Sprout Social, and HubDoc to build a predictable revenue engine. If you're looking for performance experts and creatives to solve your marketing growth problems today and help you build the foundations for the future, look no further. Visit 42agency.com to talk to a strategist right now to learn how you can build a high efficiency revenue engine. Thank you also to the sponsor for this episode, HRS Free Webmaster Tools. Now, if you want to rank your website higher in search engines, you have to make sure that your website doesn't have any technical SEO issues. Because if you do, that's like trying to run a race with your shoes tied together. That's how you lose, and we don't want that. Luckily, HRS Free Webmaster Tools can crawl up to 5,000 pages to find 140 common technical SEO issues that could be holding your site back from generating valuable traffic can also help you find your strongest backlinks as well as analyze keywords you're ranking for and see keyword search volume and ranking difficulty for each of those keywords. You can sign up for free at hrefs.com forward slash webmaster tools or find the link in the description and show notes. Well, let's get back to the episode. In terms of like another tip that I found in that article that you mentioned, one of the things that's super important is that you, you, I think this is a video you created actually. Uh, I'm going to link it in the in the show notes where you said that AI lies. 
and when it lies, it doesn't tell you that it's lying, which is like that's true. <laughs> it could give it could be giving you completely wrong information, and I feel like that you know talking about like oh man, AI is gonna take over our jobs. There is always gonna be a need to make sure that there is not just that experience, but there is that accurateness to the pieces that we're writing, and it's we're not putting on content that is not. I'm using the word lie, but like even like slightly off that somebody can tell right away, like this guy doesn't know what he's talking <laughs> or she's talking about because like they've said that completely wrong or in a different way that it's not possible. I, how, so I guess I'm curious, like how do you, how do you check if it's <laughs> truthful or useful content, especially if like it's, I don't know, like sometimes People lie well, and then I guess you need somebody who is an expert in that space to like, hey, that's that's off. Is exactly what you're leading with that. Is that correct? Yeah, and um, we so one of the things we did at Animals is we wanted to dedicate a couple of people's time to exploring how can we how can we use this technology? How can we help companies grow with it? How can we find a place for it within the kind of traditional services we offer? How can we learn about it? And this was basically problem number one to solve. If you're trying to publish a bunch of content with, by very nature of how uh, generative AI and large language models function, they are not created or designed to tell the truth. That is just not part of their design. That's not why they exist. <laughs> yeah. They are created to sound intelligible. So you feed it a bunch of related concepts and words, a prompt, whatever you want. And the challenge it is solving for itself is basically predicting what is likely to come next in terms mm. of the context you provided based on the rules of language as it understands them from having read like you know billions and billions of pages of data. So at no point is there any kind of loop, feedback loop for it to go, oh, actually I should go and check. You know, I've, I've written this quote from this famous CEO that sounds like it fits within the context of this blog post, but I should go and double check that. It does not do that. It just makes stuff up. And if you're writing a blog post about like B2B SaaS, you know, we tend to quote CEOs and CMOs and stuff in those blog posts, and it knows that, and it will do that, and it will make it up. Maybe the person it uh, attributes it to will be real, but the actual quote it creates, for the most part, it will not be real. And you have to like really like hammer this into your own psyche in terms of using these tools. Like, it is not trying to generate truthful information. Mm. It is like throwing word spaghetti at the wall and hoping interesting fragments come out of it. Uh, and the way we solved that very simply was exactly as you say, whatever topic we're writing about, find somebody that knows it really well mm. and that can actually understand the shibboleths of that topic. They can see when there are these like subtle giveaways that something's not quite right. Um, a great example, one of the writers we work with, lovely person, Angela at Animals, um, they know a lot about e-commerce. They know so much mm. more about e-commerce than I do. And I would look at what seemed to be a fairly intelligible blog post on an e-commerce topic, and I would see nothing wrong with it. Angela could pick out 20 things that were not quite <laughs> right. You know, we talked about SMS. We didn't talk about MMS and that kind of thing. Mm. Um, and you can't really replace that. So if you're going to publish this stuff without a human in the loop, you kind of have to be willing to accept it's people that know their stuff and not going to be convinced by it. Mm. Uh, and if that undermines the legitimacy of it, then yeah, maybe you shouldn't be publishing it in the first place. <laughs> and that ruins that whole credibility now of the the brand, the company, the person writing it, uh, who who the byline is under. Especially if there's like, oh, this is this is off, and like that actually in the future would perform worse. Uh, in in terms of, I'm not entirely sure what search will look like in the future <laughs> we're seeing bits and pieces of it but uh, it, you know it, if it's doesn't it's not credible it won't be pushed as much and you know like it's very easy to think about content marketing in terms of aggregate results you know we care about traffic mm. and month on month over month growth and it's very easy to forget that these are people at the end of that every page you mm. as a person and something that sounds coherent and you publish it and you feel good about it and you get some page views to it that may feel like you're doing the right job, but actually if everyone reading it is going, you guys don't know what they're talking about and bouncing <laughs> off the page, then is that actually going to have an impact on the business? Like, hmm, yeah, probably not. That's so funny. You you were talking about like how animals was exploring using AI. Actually, there's this 
article or blog post that you wrote about content cyborg. And I love that because it's a little bit of alliteration and the word cyborg is just a fun word to say. And yeah. one of the tips you talked about there is like, um, you know, front loading your article structure. I'm curious what, what that means. In some sense, I understand what it is. Like, you know, have your points, uh, have your structure and then like let AI like kind of like fill in the, the, the blanks in between. Uh, is that is that what that, that's about, or is it something uh, else completely? It's exactly about that. I think from hard-earned experience, the structure of an article is one of the most important determinants mm. of its success, basically. Um, it, you know, a lot of writers obsess over line edits and the construction of individual sentences. And what happens is they forget that actually the way they've written something is probably just a reflection of their own thought process. You know, oh, I know nothing about this. I have to write a blog post. I'm going to Google what is this thing, and I'm going to Google like some common tips, and then I'm actually going to address the actual topic. You know, like how to do a particular thing. And what you end up with is something that you know, probably well written, but you look at it and it just, it's like somebody has gone from I don't understand this to actually trying to solve the problem on paper. Mm -hmm. Like you can actually see their thought process. And for the most part, that's not very convincing. If you're trying to attract anyone that isn't like a total newbie like you are to that subject, you have to get that off the page and be a bit more discerning about the things that they will find interesting and not the things that you found interesting as you were new to the subject. And because you know, generative AI is basically learning from and emulating all the existing blog mm. posts out there, the ones that are already in its data set, those same problems you will find carried through into the output it generates because that is what a B2B blog post looks like. Yeah. So actually what we found was do not trust it with something so important <laughs> as the structure. Uh, we have to be yeah. very discerning, very deliberate right. about that, and we have mm. to be meticulous with what we include. Interesting. So what we did was we would basically write out fairly detailed header mm -hmm. structures for the information That's and cool. even have like relative weightings for the information because if you've got 1200 words, you have to solve the problem you've set for yourself and you can't afford to meander off into different directions, which generative AI will totally do if you let it. <laughs> and in terms of waiting, what does that mean? Like, do you just um, prompt it like, hey, um, spend more time in this, like why, the why part or like the section rather than the rest? Or like, how, how would you like weigh it over another part? Yeah, and this is something I encourage normal human writers to do and something that I try to do. Um, you have a topic, you work out you know, the five things you need to cover to cover that topic. Uh, chances are a couple of those are going to be much more important than the others. Maybe the other things are just context. Yeah. You need to be very deliberate about that and needs to be reflected in how you allocate word count. You want most of the word count to go toward the thing that matters most. Um, and obviously, because it's so easy to write words with generative AI, you could end up with like you know three thousand word article very very easily, and that's not actually good for the reader. So exactly yeah. that you know if something's less important, say in two hundred words, give me a summary mm. or an overview of this, and then focus on the uh, more important part of the topic. Interesting. So you actually are you giving it word maybe in certain situations are you giving it a specific word count for a specific section because you want to emphasize that more. I've, I've tried doing that. It doesn't seem to listen to yeah. me very well in most cases <laughs> yeah, from first-hand experience. Same. So there's like there's lots of like manual, you know, editing and right. like whittling yeah. down. But saying stuff like you know summarize this or make this more concise, mm. that kind of thing generally does seem to help. That makes sense. So you, so what I'm hearing, I just want to make sure I'm getting this right. You you got the headers, uh, you know, the main points. Do you have a little bit of bullet points in in between uh, for each of these points? So like, is it, it has some kind of Direct, you've already done the the meaty research, and there's like there's might you might even have like quotes in there, uh, and some points, and then you plug that into uh, Chat GPT or like whatever AI Jasper or Writer is exactly what you plug in. Is that right? Yeah. So I, I personally think there's a lot a human needs to bring to the table for this workflow to actually work. Yeah. People you need to have an idea. Of, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Idea of structure, idea of key points, anything related to your product messaging that you want to communicate as well, because the tool, not all tools have that context. You know, something like yeah. Writer might do because they're building with that in mind, but a lot of other tools don't. Right. Um, yeah. And a lot of people beg the question, like, 
this is a lot of effort. Why don't you just get a person to write it? And you know, in some cases, you actually totally should get the person to write it. If you feel like you're fighting against right. it and it's not being worthwhile, then that's true. Reevaluate that. that, um, makes, that makes sense. But there are, yeah, I think there are opportunities to improve your own workflow with this mm. stuff. That's cool. I'm curious, what's your take? Uh, how do you craft the tone of it? I've seen where like, you know, make this blog post sound like a HubSpot blog post. Another one, which is more fun, like make it sound like Ted Lasso, which I <laughs> tried once and it was like, that sounds cool. Like this very like Southern uh, enthusiastic, but do you give it prompts on ter in terms of like how you want it to sound like, or do you feed it like uh, some information about like, make it sound like me and you link a bunch of blog posts from the past? I think if you do, if you are like particularly hot on a particular like tone of voice or style or whatever, um, I've seen great results from uh, kind of contextual prompting. So you say, you know, generate a tone of voice that's X, Y, and Z. Here is an example of what that looks like. Mm. And the more the more you can give it examples and context, the more it can look right. at it and go, oh, okay, like, I see what you're getting at here. Let me emulate that. Um, and it's kind of an interesting thing to do because, you know, I see people do things where they put their blog post in they go like tell me what my tone of voice is and it pumps out <laughs> a bunch of like descriptors what? i don't think that's hugely useful though because like you know telling someone that they're enthusiastic like what does that actually right. mean how can you learn True. from yeah um but it, it can do a good job at emulating particularly unique tones of voice i think like publications like buzzfeed or whatever it can mm. get that bang on i think have you that buzzfeed is interesting i've never done that it's probably like shorter words like even a kid would understand <laughs> like are you using that kind of like have you used that in the past where like emulate like buzzfeed or emulate hubspot or i don't even emulate animals like their articles i'm sure that's enough establishment there where no i've not done that i should do the very narcissistic thing of get it to try and copy the animal's blog and see what happens <laughs> i'm gonna uh, play around with that and see see if i can learn from myself <laughs> that's so funny I, I, this is so crazy. This is something that I've been thinking a, a lot about. I use ChatGPT to uh, write some of my YouTube scripts. Like I've been doing like short form, like um, like five minute short short videos. I even asked it to like give me some puns and jokes. <laughs> that it would imbue like whole jokes about like, oh, this is like uh, I don't know, just some really corny jokes that I thought I think is funny. And it's really interesting how much you can add. Uh, in terms of in terms of the output based on your prompt is exactly what's happening here. I think anytime like you ask it to go, like, I've done this thing. Can you give me twenty more examples? Mm. It's so good at that. Yeah, it's actually quite hard for a human brain to come up with twenty different that's versions true. of the same thing. But yeah, AI does a great job there. That's it. That's really. I know we've been talking a lot about AI, and it seems like you've played around it more than other people. I'm. Is there? Uh, any other tips that you have, like any uh, like uh, tips before we switch gears in terms of like people who are tuning in, how can they create better content as a content cyborg, <laughs> as uh, AI as their uh, personal assistant uh, that can help them like actually create content that sounds and um, good. So most of the use cases I found that have like actually hugely saved me time and made me a very happy man are not necessarily writing things because mm. you know, I'm, I'm an okay writer. I know how to do that for the most <laughs> part, but there's loads of like writing adjacent stuff that oh, I'm getting so much help with. Uh, a big part of that I think is transforming information from one format into another. Mm. Um, so like, you know, YouTube video transcript, something I've been doing, which is super fun. I record a five minute video, upload it, get the automated YouTube transcript. And it's terrible. It's wrong. It's got timestamps <laughs> everywhere. But I paste that into chat GPT and I ah. say, please reformat it. And it does it pitch perfect, what? corrects the mistakes, capitalizes everything. And then you can say, you know, pull out the three core ideas from this and turn it into a basic article. And it will do that. And, you know, I'm not going to, it's not going to win awards, but <laughs> in terms of making a more accessible transcript, yeah. like you can do that in seconds. That would have been really laborious and kind of sucky yeah. for me to do in the past um and i'm also you know generative ai for images i use it every single day because right. i am not a good designer so actually even basic things with that mid journey for example yeah. are just blowing my mind yeah i'm creating custom 
illustrations for everything I publish on my personal site at the moment. Wow. Trying to get like a cohesive brand identity. And it's so easy to do. I just, ah, oh, it's almost like sickening how easy and how fun it is to get custom images. That it's, that's, I have, it, in your blog is, oh, it's your blog post. Are you also doing it for, I know you have this content concepts where like, it looks cool. You talk about like weasel words and parietal content. Are those created by Midjourney or? Really? Yeah, hundred percent, hundred percent. Yeah, wow. very simple Pre-mortem. printing. Yeah, uh, all those images. Yeah, they're all. all what is your prompt for that? Like, do you plug in like some of your previous image and like make it black and white and give me, I don't know, like Chekhov's gun, like a gun on a wall. So I basically I think of like what is a good visual representation of this mm. concept. That's the hard part, and yeah. you know, years of doing that for the animals blog have helped me get vaguely okay at doing that. And you know, yeah, think of whatever visual metaphor you want, and then try and create some kind of consistent style through the prompting. So I say right. stuff like simple line illustration, black and white, and then you have the aspect ratio you want, with the model you want to call on. That's really cool. There's some crazy stuff you can do around image seeding, where you can actually use the same seed for every generation, mm. theoretically get it more consistent. But like that's slightly beyond my level. This this is just blowing my mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that, so that, good. This, so this good. looks so good. The images. I'm gonna link your content concepts and essays. <laughs> Ryan Law. That me, but like, it is just like wow. That's all created. You said Mid Journey, right? Because there's a few Mid-journey. other. Mid Journey. Yeah, I started cool. using it um, to create images for the fiction I'm writing because it is oh. sensation, like, like fantasy style imagery. Really? Yeah. You have a new book coming. New fantasy book coming out, or like well, I know at you some have... point, at some <laughs> point, I've, I've written two so far, and I'm trying to finish the trilogy. But that's a uh, long-term project. That's super cool. I'm gonna link those. In. I actually have bought it. I haven't started, but I will read oh. it, the first one for sure. You're making <laughs> me very happy today. <laughs> I actually want to switch gear. Thank you for talking about AI uh, and making that more useful for content. I find I find that really interesting. Like repurposing. Actually, I have a follow up question around your your YouTube one. ChatGPT has like a limit in terms of, of like the input. Are you using a plugin to take that? I'm not sure what they're limited in terms of like word count in terms of um, the input, but are you just like, cop- is it fitting in when you paste the YouTube, like your your um, transcription or your caption right into thing and then you say, hey, fix this up. Or- so I'm, I am hitting the upper limit with some of my longer videos. So yeah. anything less than 10 minutes, the transcript actually seems to fit in a single uh, prompt because they're constantly increasing. That. Right. Um, and I do find if I have to paste it in two parts, the result so far has been way worse than if I can provide it <laughs> the entire thing in one go. But they're constantly increasing like the, uh, the limits of the... I didn't know that. With, so, yeah, and then do you, you just ask it, fix because I have this problem where like it, um, YouTube takes the caption and I'm like... My name is not Rambly. It's you know, <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah, exactly. <laughs> like that. Or you, you. What's your prompt for? Like fix this up and make it readable. Is that what you tell? I say stuff like uh, turn this you know, transcript into fluid prose. Remove timestamps. Correct typographic errors. And you know, in that case, replace the word Rambly. <laughs> <laughs> with, with, like rambly in the actual word you can be quite specific about that and uh, so okay. far yeah it's actually been pretty consistent with pros i like that okay i'm gonna I, i'm gonna do that right after <laughs> to see <laughs> that's super cool thank you for sharing that i just got something uh, awesome to go away from here i want to shift gears and talk about career power-ups those are things that us help you accelerate your career i know you've been in content marketing now over a decade, uh, you know, like you started your own agency, you worked at Animals, um, and then now, uh, you know, you really like so much experience in, in, in terms of marketing and, and content. I'm curious what's helped accelerate your career. It could be many things. It could be like, you know, networking or like talking to people, but it could also be a hard skill, like, you know, learning you how to use AI. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure. Probably reflecting back one of the things i'm really glad i was able to do is um write stuff that voices an opinion basically Mm. because i think back on the early like five six years of my career and i was writing search content uh lots of utilitarian like how to stuff um what is posts all that kind of thing and it was great you know i got our first company blog up to like a million page views uh, in a year kind of thing wow 
humble four-person agency blog just on the back of search. But the thing is, nobody really cared about it. Didn't result in any new business, um, didn't result in any career opportunities for me or anything like that, because it was just like totally utilitarian functional content that basically left your head as soon as you'd solved the problem or mm. another page. And as soon as I got to animals and I started working with Jimmy Daly, who was like heading the animals blog before I took it over, they published opinionated content. Like they actually shared opinions. They saw right. what was happening and they said like, I agree with this or I don't agree with this. And it was really scary to begin with because you don't want to risk being wrong. <laughs> and there's always that risk you run, but yeah. by polarizing people, like people actually remember it. If you, you resonate with them, they remember that idea. Right. Maybe you validate an opinion they've held before. Even if they don't agree, they remember you for doing that. And as long as it's a defensible human, you know, not monstrous opinion you've had, <laughs> I think it's a great way to stand out because most content does not share an opinion. Mm. Um, so yeah, very lucky that I had an avenue for doing that and not really realized that was what I was doing. But people come up to me now and they say like, oh, I remember you shared this and it totally changed my mind about something. Wow. They remember that. It actually sticks in their head. That's I find that interesting. I, I was talking to Tommy Walker yesterday from the content studio. Uh, you were on that show. I should link your you know, So I'm going to be on that show as well. But one of the things that I landed on and it told him was like great content transforms people like it's like this this you know content is a job um there's the whole concept of jobs to be done and the concept is products transform people to become better version of the self and it's true for content too where like you sharing an opinion kind of helps shape their people's it transformed them <laughs> exactly what you just mentioned uh, with that person well thank you for changing my mind about this because so you help like change who they are and you know, maybe I'm reaching here, but who who they'll be and what they'll they'll decide because of, of what you shared there exactly. So. I'm I'm curious, how do you get over that fear? I know for people who are like, you mentioned about like sh being wrong and sharing an opinion, and the internet can be a very harsh, <laughs> harsh, harsh place. Uh, especially, uh, yeah, I, I'm not sure, but I find sometimes Twitter can be really harsh with people who have wrong opinions. How did you, how do you get overcome that? Especially for people who are tuning in who are like, I, I don't want to share my opinion. I'm scared of being shut down right away. Uh, I've not entirely overcome that because I still take criticism incredibly personally. I wish I was thicker mm -hmm. skin. I still find it very hard. Um, I actually published something a couple of months back and um, I ended up seeing this whole LinkedIn thread that was just dragging the idea. And I, wow. I took it so personally, I, I did, <laughs> you know, walk away from my computer for a bit and kind of introspect and reflect on what had happened. Um, and it's a hard thing to get over. I think having people around you whose judgment you trust, who are willing to support you in what you're doing, that is a really useful starting point. Because if you can find five people that go, you know what, this is a good idea then even if you get some criticism out in the world, at least you you have the defensibility of other people thinking it was a good yeah. idea. Like you're unified around sharing that together. Uh, and I was always very lucky to have that animals, you know, people mm. beat up my article ideas with me. We'd go back and forth over it, play with different framings. And they would tell me when I was wrong because I was mm. wrong many, many, many times in terms of things I've thought or, or said. Um, and I guess the other part of it is just maybe start small. You don't have to be the iconoclast that goes out and like starts ranting about why X company is wrong or why Y strategy is the stupidest thing you've right. ever heard. Yeah. Um, something I talk about in the first course I put together is this idea of like yes and ideation. Mm. So a really great way to get started is to find something you agree with and then add additional context to right. it. So if somebody shares a really great opinion, you can publish your own article mm. that goes, we agree with this concept. Here's how the practical experience we have that validates this or you know i zoomed in on one specific subtopic and went into great detail about this um, and that kind of de-risks that existential problem of whether people will hate it or whether right. they'll think you're wrong and stupid and terrible <laughs> what i like about that is you, you when you surround yourself with people you trust who are honest with you you can almost like workshop your opinions with them and kind of like 
hey, am I totally off the balls, uh, off the nuts here? Like, I'm not, does this make sense or not? And them giving you feedback can help you kind of gain that confidence to take that leap is exactly what I've I heard you, um, you know, you, you apply to, to you sharing your opinion. Would you say, would totally. You say Although I would say there is one caveat there, which is that if you bring too many people in, it's very easy to end up mm. kind of, you know, this committee led ideation method and, <laughs> you know, you end up watering everything down to appeal to like the broadest cross section of people. So have some big spicy opinion and a couple of people whose judgment you trust intimately. Uh, and then leave it there, just publish it and you know let it fly and see what happens. Mm. That's super. How many of those people do you have? Like a handful, like um, five or less? I'm just curious. I think this is really, really great concept, not just for content but or marketers, but like life in general. Have those like handful of trusted advisors that can give you opinion on your work or your career direction so to speak and that's done well for you um yeah so like it, it you there's you said there's too much there's a point where there's too many um I'm, for me myself i think i have three people that i trust and talk to about the growth and content and marketing in general but is that like what's is that about the same number that you have like in terms of people that you chat with yeah, probably. And maybe a couple more because um, basically I was very lucky that when I joined Animals, the people that were running it at the time were just so much smarter than me. And they all had like different skills that I didn't have and they could all bring like new perspective to it. Um, so like there was Andrew, who was this amazing critical thinker and an actual legit neuroscientist who brought this entire background wow. to it. There was Jimmy, who was just like the most legendary marketer ever. Devin, who became CEO at Animals, and she's like yeah. this huge visionary that always challenged me to think bigger about what we were doing. Right. And like Walter, who founded the company, and he, you know, smartest dude I've ever met, he would tell me, like, right, this is stupid. Let's work through and make this better. <laughs> and it would always be better as a result of that. Right. So between that, a little like brain trust and those different perspectives, like mm. I learned a huge amount. <laughs> That's super cool. Thank you for sharing that. One final question. If you can send a message to a younger version of, of you, of Ryan, what advice would you give yourself who might be like just freelancing, starting out, kind of figure out what he wants to do? What would be the message you can send across the time? And once again, it could be something we've already talked about or something that you haven't shared yet to, to, your, to your younger self. I'd probably say two things. Um, First up, like the willingness to do hard things is a really powerful moat. If you are willing wow. to do something that other people won't do, that is a great way to set yourself up. Um, the example I had is if, like when I was you know, starting out in content marketing, I was the dude that would endlessly grind out 10,000 word articles. And you wow. know, people didn't want to do that because it sucked. I hated it. <laughs> I didn't enjoy it, but it became this like thing. This like shtick that I could talk about and kind of vaguely get known for and I'd get good results from it. Right. Or because I was willing to like sit down and grind that out over the course right. of a couple of days. And you know, if something's quite easy to do, everyone will do it. And it's very hard yeah. to stand out and differentiate from those. So, you know, maybe you can be the person that goes and interviews 20 people for the next article you write. Um, that kind of willingness to do hard things is such a powerful moat. Uh, and I guess something kind of related to that is don't compete on the same terms as other people if you can avoid that. Wow. Think about like job applications or whatever, you know, like if you go through the standard process of application and CV and you are relinquishing a lot of the control over that process, you have to be very, very lucky for that to work out in your favor, especially in like a crazy job market now. But if you can be the person that's building their own content and actually building their own audience and showing people that you have the skills and not just talking about it, that's amazing. Or maybe you're the one that's networking and trying to actually get in touch with the people that might eventually hire you and running all these calls or whatever. If you can do, again, do stuff that other people aren't willing to do, and that can really set yourself up for success. That's, just, that's so good. That kind of like ties back to everything we just talked about. AI makes everything easier, but if you do the hard stuff, 
you know, like he was out of yourself. Oh, home. we came full circle. You did it. That's beautiful. <laughs> oh, I love it. It was all planned out. We have this all <laughs> like scripted. We love this conversation with Ryan. He's such an awesome dude. If you can learn more about Ryan, you can follow him on LinkedIn and Twitter. He also has courses on thought leadership at ryanlaw.podia.com. All of those links are in the show notes in the description. Thanks to Ryan for being on the show. If you enjoyed this episode, you'd love the Marketing Power-Ups newsletter. I share the actionable takeaways and break down the frameworks of world-class marketers. You can go to marketingpowerups.com to subscribe and you'll instantly unlock the three best frameworks that top marketers use to hit their KPIs consistently and wow their colleagues. I want to say thank you to you for listening and please like and follow Marketing Power Ups on YouTube, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. If you're feeling extra generous, kind of leave a review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And leave a comment on YouTube. It goes a long way in others finding out about Marketing Power Ups. Thanks to Mary Solden for creating the artwork and design. And thank you to Faisal Taigo for editing the intro video. And of course, thank you for listening. That's all for now. Have a powered up day. Marketing Power Ups. Until the next episode...